First of all, just to remind you very briefly of some basic facts about Eliot as background to what I'm saying the main theme. He lived from 1888 to 1965, was born in St. Louis in the Midwest, but his roots were, in fact, in Boston, where his family were leading Unitarians. He studied at Harvard, the Sorbonne, and Oxford before joining Lloyd's Bank in 1917. He founded the Criterion and placed it at the cutting edge of European literature. He published The Wasteland in 1922, which made a bigger impact than any other 20th century piece of literature. It was seen as the voice of a disillusioned generation, but no less expressed the pain and distress of Eliot's own first marriage. Eliot was the most discerning critic of his time, the great arbiter of taste, who shaped people's evaluation of poetry and poets for a generation to come. And this was further reinforced when he became a director of Faber and Faber. In 1927, he was baptized and adopted a disciplined life as an Anglo-Catholic Christian. This was reflected in his poetry and culminated in the four quartets, the major Christian poem of the century. Eliot attempted to revive poetic drama and murder in the cathedral is still staged, but his West End plays suffered in comparison with a very different kind of play being performed after World War II. After the death of his first wife, he found happiness in a marriage with Vivian Fletcher, who guarded his legacy and meticulously edited his correspondence. Now, in his foreword to For Lancelot Andrews, published in 1928, Eliot announced to a startled world that his general point of view could be described as classicist in literature, royalist in politics, and Anglo-Catholic in religion. The previous year, on June the 29th, 1927, he'd been baptized behind locked doors in the little church at Fenstock near Oxford, later, interestingly, the church of Barbara Pym. And the following morning, he was confirmed at Cudston by the Bishop of Oxford, Tommy Strong. His friend, W.T. Stead, was sworn to secrecy. I hate spectacular conversions, wrote Eliot to him very firmly. Now, I approached that conversion with three interlinked questions in mind. From what was he converted? Uh, why did he convert? And what was the immediate effect of that conversion? And the seven volumes of Eliot's letters published in recent years are a very helpful way into some of these answers. And I'll end by considering how his newfound faith is reflected in some of the poems he wrote at the time. So first, from what was he converted? Eliot was brought up in the heart of New England Unitarianism. His mother's father-in-law, Walter Greenleaf Eliot, was a leading light in the movement and was a great hero and family role model. And the whole family held a prominent position in the church. Indeed, later, Eliot later described them as the Borgias of the papacy, though anything less like the Borgias in moral character would be hard to imagine. For this Unitarianism was characterized by a strong sense of moral duty, high-mindedness, and the importance of education. So from an early age, he had instilled in him the ideals of unselfishness and public service, not least through the Unitarian church the family attended on Sundays. This exacting demand pressed heavily on him throughout his life. But emotionally and spiritually, this form of religion had no appeal to young Tom. And when he went as a student to Harvard, he was indifferent to the church. Even as a boy, Eliot had read a life of the Buddha and at Harvard read widely in Eastern philosophy and mysticism and learnt Sanskrit and Pali. And his latest biography sets out in some detail the extensive range of those courses. And this interest was not just theoretical. For about this time, of the time of his graduation ceremony from Harvard, he had the first of a few experiences, the memory of which was to haunt him all his life. As Lyndall Gordon put it, while walking one day in Boston, he saw the street suddenly shrink and divide. His everyday preoccupations, his past, all the claims of the future fell away, and he was enfolded in a great silence. He had another one of those experiences later uh, in uh, Paris, and they are reflected 
in, at least in one line uh, in his great poem, The Wasteland, looking into the heart of light, uh, the silence. Some years later, in the first of the four quartets, his major Christian poem, Eliot's poetry reflects a visit he paid with Emily Hale to a Cotswold manor house burnt Norton, and in particular the moment when they stood by the empty swimming pool, an experience that previously he'd interpreted in, very, in general terms, he had by then incorporated into a Christian framework. Dry the pool, dry concrete, brown-edged, and the pool was filled with water out of sunlight, and the lotus rose quietly, quietly, the surface glittered out of heart of light. Another thread in the background for Eliot's conversion was the fact that he had a Roman Catholic nanny to whom he was devoted. She used to take him on occasions to the colourful Church of the Immaculate Conception, which he said, I like very much. Also, he said later, he remembered a theological argument about God as first cause being put to me at the age of six by a devoutly Catholic Irish nursemaid. And the attraction towards Roman Catholicism re-emerged much later in intellectual form when he was reflecting on the nature of tradition. As is well known, Eliot came to think that you could only be truly modern if you were deeply steeped in a tradition. Otherwise, you were simply in danger of repeating the past by being swept up in the fads of the present. Indeed, he said that anyone who wanted to continue as a poet beyond the age of 30 had to write uh, with the whole sweep of European literature from Homer onwards uh, in their bones. He was not a member of any church, and he mocked what he called the true church in his poem, The Hippopotamus. But he used to visit Anglo-Catholic city churches in his lunch hour, and he was conscious of Catholicism as the only church which can even pretend to maintain a philosophy of its own. There is another aspect of this emphasis on tradition too. Delivering some extramural lectures on French literature in Ilkley, of all places, in order to earn some money, he stressed the need for form and restraint in writing in contrast to Romanticism. A classicist in art and literature will therefore be likely to adhere to a monarchical form of government and to the Catholic Church, he wrote. And this is because at the bottom of man's heart there is always the beast, and therefore man requires an ascasis, that is, strict spiritual self-discipline. Now, another element in the movement of his mind at this time was his reading of Lancelot Andrews Don, Don, and Don and Herbert from 1918 onwards as part of his consideration of the sermon as perhaps what he called the most difficult form of art. And in the same way that C.S. Lewis found himself hugely attracted to Christian authors some time before he himself converted to Christianity, Eliot was being drawn in the same way. There's one further consideration about Eliot's pre-conversion outlook, his scepticism. Eliot always had a questioning, critical mind. It's one of the aspects of his character that fed into his great sense of mischievous humour, which he retained even in his darkest hours. Then when he was studying at Oxford, he became particularly interested in, in sceptical attitudes which called any dogmatic point of view into his question. This, then, was the background from which Eliot was converted. First, from his Unitarian upbringing, he retained a strong sense of duty, but reacted against its dry, over-optimistic view of life. As he put it, Unitarianism is a bad preparation for brass tacks, like birth, copulation, death, hell, heaven, and insanity. Secondly, there was his developing interest in Eastern religions and mysticism, together with some powerful experience of heightened awareness, which at the time he did not interpret in religious terms. And thirdly, his reaction against individualism and romanticism, leading him not just to see the importance of tradition in literature, but the strength of Catholic Christianity, and Christianity with its realistic understanding of the seed of evil in the human heart, and the consequent need for ascasis or self-discipline. And fourthly, there was a sceptical side to him by nature, 
which was reinforced by his philosophical studies. And as we shall see, this remained part of him even after his conversion. Eliot announced his new belief in 1928 in a sudden, peremptory manner. But of course, the various elements just mentioned were fermenting and mixing along the way. In 1910, he wrote some blasphemous poems, which is indicative because he regarded blasphemy as stemming from a partial belief of a mind in a particular and unusual state of spiritual sickness, and might even be, he said, a way of affirming belief. Then, in 1914, he was to write some visionary lines that, over the years that developed into the wasteland, finished finally in 1921. Uh, this poem was later dismissed by Eliot as a personal grouse against life, but as I've mentioned, it was seen by others as the voice of that generation. And though it is Sanskrit in some of its wording and Buddhist in some of its imagery, it is a poem that not only contains Christian themes, but has a strong sense of Christian imperative in it to lead an exemplary right life. Then in 1926, to the surprise of his brother and sister-in-law, who were with him on a visit to Rome, Eliot suddenly fell on his knees before Michelangelo's Pieta. About the same time, he was struck by the number of people kneeling in the city churches he visited. An aunt of his had written to a friend who had joined the Episcopal Church in America, do you kneel down in church and call yourself a miserable sinner? Neither I nor my family will ever do that. <laughs> but that gesture of abasement and worship was increasingly what Eliot did want to do and which he did the following year when he was baptized. He wanted to kneel. And this was followed some months later by his first confession. Eliot wrote to W.T. Stead, who had helped him on his way to baptism, that he had a sense of extraordinary sense of surrender and gain, as if he had crossed a very wide, deep river, never to return. So why... The second question we come to is then, why did Eliot convert? And the clue is given in the very stark and definitive way in which he describes his new commitment as classicist, monarchist, and Catholic. He wanted more than a vague mysticism and more than a self-sufficient moralism. He wanted something with a clear structure and discipline to it. Now, classicism might be defined in a number of ways, but one thing is certain is that it is opposed to what Eliot called the undisciplined squads of emotion, which drive so many of our words. Now, again, royalism can be variously interpreted, but at the least it indicates structure and degree. And as, Troilus, as Shakespeare put it in Troilus and Cressida, take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere appugnancy. A very thoroughly researched book by Barry Spur shows the influence on T.S. Eliot uh, of very definite Anglo-Catholic beliefs and practices. Uh, and he ar Spur argues that it is impossible to engage in Eliot's poetry without a knowledge of the very particular religious milieu which Eliot found his spiritual home as it existed from the 1920s to about 1955. Uh, and in his book, he describes it for those unfamiliar with it today. Indeed, it is part of Spur's thesis that this particular Anglo-Catholic world no longer exists and needs explanation as much as any other past period of history. Now, the immediate background of the conversion, why the need for a definite structure and discipline was so urgent, was the fact that Eliot's life, personal life, was a desperately unhappy mess. The anguished, hellish marriage for both Tom and his wife Vivian, together with trying to do his job at the bank and later at Faber's, keeping up his serious literary work and earn enough money to pay for the very, very heavy medical expenses for his wife, was in taking an increasingly heavy toll on him. He was barely coping. Indeed, he was always on the edge of a breakdown. He needed something to hold his life together. And similarly, it was the desire to find something more solid than the individualism, 
relativism and emotionalism that he thought was rotting Western civilization. He was looking for a secure political order that could be sustained by an objective moral realm. He was later to write, the Christian scheme seemed the only possible scheme which found a place for values which I must maintain or perish. And belief comes first and practice second. The belief, for instance, in holy living and holy dying, in sanctity, chastity, humility, austerity. And it was for this reason that he much regretted the intellectual breakup of Europe and the rise of Protestantism, and why he said he preferred the outlook of the 13th century to that of the 17th century. Now, another factor in his move to the Christian faith was the thinness of Bertrand Russell's arguments. Uh, some of you will remember that the leading atheist, best-known atheist at that time, was Bertrand Russell, the philosopher. Bertrand Russell was a very, very old friend of Eliot. Uh, but Eliot uh, wrote to him about Russell's pamphlet on Christianity to say that it was a piece of childish folly and that the arguments in it had been familiar to him at the age of six or eight. He took serious atheism very seriously and said that atheism should always be encouraged for the sake of the faith. But about Bertrand Russell, and indeed to Russell himself, he wrote, what I dislike is the smell of the corpse of Protestantism passing down the river. As you will have gathered, Eliot had a very pessimistic view of human nature, his own and other people's. All human relationships, he thought, turned out to be a delusion and a cheat. However, he said, the love of God takes the place of the cynicism which otherwise is inevitable in every rational person. On the basis of this love of God, then every human love is enhanced and can be celebrated. Now, the reference to cynicism is from a very important letter to Geoffrey Faber, who had accused him of being too austere, in which Eliot sets out the right relationship between the love of God and the most material uh, of uh, pleasures. Now, a particular interest in all these letters that have been published over this last decade uh, is volume six, in connection with some correspondence he had with the poet Stephen Spender in 19... 30 in, over his 1932 broadcast, in which Eliot discusses how his mind has moved towards faith. And as already mentioned, he said he needed to hold to values without which he would perish. But in his view, values depended on religions. And those values would be expressed in highly disciplined Christian living. He had nothing but scorn for the average product of the English public school system, which sought, he believed, to turn out gentlemen rather than Christians, the two being totally antithetical. He also argues that the real choice to be made is between Christianity and communism, though he certainly didn't want to be in line with the usual anti-communism. He said he loathed both communism and the society in which he was then living, and he reserved particular scorn for the conservative party of the time, which he saw as nothing more than an unsavoury alliance of liberalism and laissez-faire economics. He looked for an alternative Christian way of ordering society, an idea which took form, book form some seven years later, that book of his called The Idea of a Christian Society. For now he needed a structure and a discipline to hold his own life together. And the Anglo-Catholicism of the 1920s provided just that. The Puritan element from his New England upbringing could find an outlet in the rigors of self-examination and confession. His mystical yearning could find its true goal and fulfillment in the adoration of the God who became incarnate and who was present to us in the Blessed Sacrament, the defining difference for him between his new creed and his Unitarian background. And in, Ang Ang this, in Anglicanism, this sacramental form brought with a sense a mystery and awe in which his desire to worship could find proper expression. And his belief in the importance of tradition found its home in his sense of belonging to the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. There is, of course, the question which might really well have occurred to him. Why did he become an Anglican rather than a Roman Catholic? It would have been very natural for him to become a Roman Catholic, 
given what, uh, what we know of his Thomistic philosophy of life and because of his wide knowledge and deep sympathy for European culture as a whole. But he valued the greater freedom of thought provided the church, by the Church of England uh, and the more moderate via media it provided to religious excesses. When he first started to read sermons in 1980, 18, read them for their literary form, he'd first been excited by John Donne. Later, however, it was the sober approach of people like Lancelot Anslews, with their settled, resolute will to holiness, uh, drew him. Then there was George Herbert, of course, as well. Then not least was his consciousness of his English family forebears and fitting naturally into their continuing life as an English Christian and not just as a European intellectual. And this leads on to the third question. What was the immediate effect of this conversion? The answer, again, is quite clear. A new discipline of life. As mentioned, he made his first confession, and that discipline continued. Indeed, he sought a new confessor, one who would be much more severe with him. He became a nearly daily communicant, and he agreed to be a church warden at St. Stephen's Gloucester Road, a role he held for 25 years. And there's a telling anecdote by Herbert Reed, the art historian, who was staying with Elliot in the spare bedroom when he said he was woken up in the morning by a slight noise. He saw a hand sliding through the door to reach first an umbrella and then a bowler hat before the door slipped shut again. It was Elliot going off to weekday early morning communion. And it was the first indication he had that Eliot had become a Christian. Now, some lines from the four quartets succinctly sum up his approach to life. Eliot refers to those moments in life when we're taken out of ourselves, for example, by music. But as he writes, these are only hints followed by guesses. What matters are the basic disciplines of the Christian life, prayer, observance, thought, and action. Let me just read that, those few lines. For most of us, there is only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time, the distraction fit, lost in a shaft of sunlight, the wild time unseen, or the winter lightning, or the waterfall, or music heard so deeply that it is not heard at all, but you are the music while the music lasts. These are only hints and guesses, Hints followed by guesses, and the rest is prayer, observance, discipline, thought, and action. The hint half guessed, the gift half understood, is incarnation. There is a revealing letter about this time to his American scholar friend Paul Moore, in which Eliot refers to people who seem to have no need of religion. He wrote, they may be very good or very happy. They simply seem to miss nothing, to be unconscious of any void. The void I find in the middle of all human happiness and all human relationships, and which there is only one thing which will fill it. I am one whom this sense of void tends to drive towards asceticism or sensuality, and only Christianity helps to reconcile me to life, which is otherwise disgusting. But the people I have in mind, the good ones are much more puzzling than the bad, have an easy and innocent acceptance of life that I simply can't understand. It's more bewildering than the problem of evil. Now, some people, when they convert, become narrow and intolerant in defense of their new faith. Almost the opposite happened to Eliot. He became, if anything, even more open intellectually to a range of truth. He continued to select or commission articles for the criterion on the same grounds as before. Nearly all the people he knew were shocked and appalled by the new turn in Eliot's life, but he remained remarkably unfazed by their attacks on him, and he continued to have good relationships even with people who had sharply and for the wrong reasons savaged his new faith. He remained friends with people who had very different views of life to his own, 
which was nearly all the people he knew, continuing to offer objective literary judgments about their literary worth of their writing. There was no insecure defensiveness about him. And this was because he had first faced in himself all the worst things that anyone else might say. Conrad Aiken, for example, had criticised Sir Lancet Andrews as showing, quote, a thin and vinegarish hostility to the modern world, a complete abdication of intelligence, etc., to which Eliot replied, you may be right. Most of these criticisms I had anticipated or made myself. Thrice armed is he who knows what a humbug he is. My progress, if I ever make any, will be purging myself of a large number of impure motives. More widely, he welcomed the new hostile situation in which Christians now found themselves, for it released the Christian faith from what had burdened it since the 18th century, namely being a badge of respectability for the English middle classes. Now we get an idea of the kind of intellectual culture in which Eliot moved in a letter he wrote to Paul Elmer Moore, distinguished American scholar who'd followed much the same path as Eliot himself. Eliot wrote, I might almost say that I never met any Christians until after I had made up mind to become one. He knew that his conversion would expose him to ridicule, but this didn't daunt him. As he said, anyone who has been moving in intellectual circles and comes to the church may experience an odd, rather exhilarating feeling of isolation. His new faith was a definite one in the sense that it fully adopted the creed and outlook of the Anglo-Catholicism of the day and was hostile to any liberalizing tendencies. And we find this at its most startling in his attitude to Paul Elmer's views on hell. He liked and deeply respected Moore as a person and a scholar, but found his view of hell too liberal. Is your God Santa Claus, he asked, and continued, to be damned for the glory of God is sense, not paradox. And throughout the letters of the period, there are the same strong, lucid opinions on a whole range of subjects, literary, political, and religious, stern and uncompromising in tone, yet also self-mocking and caring of the recipient. They indicate the kind of difference becoming a Christian, and particular a Catholic Anglican made to his life. He wrote, I know just enough and no more of the peace of God to know that it is an extraordinarily painful blessing. And again he wrote, Faith is not a substitute for anything. It does not give things that life has refused, but something else. And in the ordinary sense, it does not make one happier. I mentioned Eliot's skeptical cast of mind. This did not change with his conversion. He continued to be highly critical of Western culture and religion, and of course, of course, but neither did he allow the fundamental questions about faith to go away. Rather, he believed that in one sense, they became intensified. And one of the reasons that Eliot was drawn to Pascal was that he said he, quotes, faced unflinchingly the demon of doubt, which is inseparable from the spirit of belief. Again, he wrote, every man who thinks and lives by thought must have his own skepticism, that which stops at the question, that which ends in denial, or that which leads to faith and which is somehow integrated into the faith which transcends it. And he also wrote, the more conscious becomes the belief, so the more conscious becomes the unbelief. Indifference, doubt, and skepticism appear. A higher religion imposes a conflict, a division, torment, and struggle uh, within the individual. As Eliot brought out in an important letter to Geoffrey Faber, which I haven't quoted, he did in fact relish the ordinary pleasures uh, of life and found them enhanced by his religion. Uh, there were extraordinary details in this, the, these letters. For example, uh, that, that he, he knew uh, uh, 50 different kinds of cheese and could evaluate them all in terms of the quality of their, of their taste. 
I mean, just one of those absurd details. So despite all this darkness, you know, he, he did manage to find some pleasures in life. Later on in life, with his second marriage, he was to discover an unexpected happiness in love. Uh, but for this period of his life, what he discovered through his faith was something much tougher. As he put it, to me, religion has brought at least the perception of something above morals and therefore extremely terrifying. It has brought me not happiness, but the sense of something above happiness and therefore more terrifying than ordinary pain and misery, the very dark, dark night and the desert. Now, in 1927, the year of his conversion, Eliot wrote his poem, The Journey of the Magi. He wrote it quickly between church and lunch one Sunday with the aid of half a bottle of gin. <laughs> Much of it is based on Lancelot Andrew, Andrew's Christmas Sermon of 1662, uh, which describes a long, hard journey uh, to Bethlehem. Some of the imagery clearly draws on the New Testament. Some of the imagery, though highly evocative, seems uh, ob obscure. Um, let me just read a little bit of that. That will be familiar to many of you, I think, because uh, it tends to be a poem which is read quite a lot around the, the Christmas period. If you remember, it begins uh, with lines from uh, a sermon of Lancelot N. Andrews. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camel's galled, sore-footed refactory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet, etc., etc. And then, all this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down this, set down this, where we led all the way for birth or death. There was birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen in birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, no longer at ease here in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. So that poem as a whole clearly reflects Eliot's own journey to faith and the long journey that lay ahead of him as a Christian. As he put it to his friend Paul Elmer Moore, most critics appear to think that my Catholicism is merely an escape, an evasion. One was supposed to have settled oneself in an easy chair when one has only just begun a long journey on foot. He already knows that this journey though it involves the recognition of a birth, means for him a personal death, a displacement of the self, a prizing away of the self's attachments of so much he'd valued before. Afterwards, the Magi leave the Christ child to return home, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. So as Eliot put it elsewhere, we are certainly a minority, even in what are called Christian countries. We find the minds of the people about us growing more and more alien, so that on vital matters we often find we have no common assumptions. The next term he wrote was a, a song for Simeon, based upon the story in the New Testament of which we get from the Nunc Dovetis, which is said as at evening uh, prayer. Uh, then after that, in 1929, he wrote Animula, not quite so well uh, as, as another's. Uh, but the key poem for Light, it sheds on what his conversion meant to Eliot, emotionally and uh, spiritually, uh, is Ash Wednesday. Although published in its present form in 1930, the four sections were all completed by 1928, some of them published separately, and the themes had obviously been in his mind before that key date of 1927, when he announced his new faith to the world. 
He did not, disliked it being called a religious, let alone a devotional poem. Rather, he said, it marked a stage in a person's life. To put it in very prosaic terms, it is a poem of renunciation, a resolve not to turn back to what the world values, a determination not to look back with longing, regrets, or nostalgia. It is a poem in which all hope is given up, because in the words of John of the Cross, which he used later in Bernd Norton, one of the sections of four quartets, hope would be hope for the wrong thing. So Ash Wednesday begins with the hope that he would not have to turn again. Because I do not hope to turn again, because I do not hope, because I do not hope to turn, desiring this man's gift and that man's scope, I no longer strive to strive towards such things. Why should the aged eagle stretch its wings? Why should I mourn the vanished power of the usual reign? Because I do not hope to know again the infirm glory of the positive hour, because I do not think, because I know I shall not know the one veritable transitory power, because I cannot drink there where trees flower and springs flow, for there is nothing again. Now the key opening, because I do not hope to turn again, comes from an Italian poet from the 13th century whom he much admired called Cavalcanti, and Pound also had much admired it, perché io non spero di tornare già mai, and the line lodged itself in Illit's mind, and he could not rest until he'd used it. And the poem is full of other borrowings, borrowing rather than allusion being Eliot's method, borrowings from the Psalms and other parts of Scripture, the liturgy, prayers of the church. And these references are often clear in themselves, but people complain then and continue to do so about the poem's obscurity. Eliot believed that a poem should be obscure, like life, he said, or any living thing, it needs to be appreciated for the mystery of itself, in itself. It is not a conundrum to be solved. Some of the imagery he admitted, like the yew tree in the Veiled Sister, even came from his recurrent dreams. And they give the poem a hallucinatory, film-like effect. And this, combined with its incantatory tone, endows it with a haunting quality. Now that said, Ellert is quite clear what the poem is fundamentally about. For he said, it was a deliberate vita nuova of Dante. In that book, Dante's sight of Beatrice kindles his love, and that love leads him to the Virgin Mary and onward up to the mountain of purgatory. Eliot seems to have had his own Beatrice in Emily Hale, an American friend with whom he corresponded over the years. Eliot once discussed with his friend W.T. Stead how Dante's love for Beatrice had passed over into the love of God in the Vita Nuova. I've had that experience, said Eliot eagerly and rather shyly, and lapsed, then lapsed into silence. It was Emily Hale who went with Eliot to Bernd Norton in September 1934, a visit which inspired not only the title of the poem, but a mystical moment by the empty pool, which I described earlier. And before that in the poem, uh, there are lines uh, uh, about paths which were not followed. The persona of the poem is in the desert, Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. Everywhere is desolation, disillusion. The air is dry and all is dead. But a lady appears, who points to Mary, who leads him out of the desert. As Eliot wrote, I have found my own love for a woman enhanced, purified, and intensified by meditation on the Virgin. But it was in the desert that he found the secret of peace. Again from Dante, this time Paradiso III, e la sua volontate in nostra pace, our peace in his will. So the poem has a number of, of, of sections um, with some very memorable imagery. Um, Lady three white leopards sat under a juniper tree, 
in the cool of day, having fed to satiety. On my legs, my heart, my liver, and that which had been contained in the hollow round of my skull. And God said, shall these bones live? Shall these bones live? And that which had been contained in the bones, which were already dry, said chirping, because of the goodness of this lady and because of her loveliness and because she honours the Virgin in meditation, we shine with brightness. Then uh, there's a wonderful imagery of the spiral staircase going up. In the first turning, the second stair, I turned and saw below the same shape twisted on the banister under the vapour in the fetid air, struggling with the devil of the stairs who wears the deceitful face of hope and despair. So he goes up the stairways and he meets towards the end the, what he, one he calls uh, the veiled uh, sister. So just to end on, on the end of, of, of that, that, that Ash Wednesday where it comes to uh, uh, some lines which really sum up what he really found through his uh, Christianity. Blessed sister, holy mother, spirit of the fountain, spirit of the garden, suffer us not to mark ourselves with falsehood. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Even among these rocks, our peace in his will. And even among these rocks, sister, mother, and spirit of the river, spirit of the sea, Suffer me not to be separated, and let my cry come unto thee. Now some of you will immediately recognise some of those phrases, of course, the straight from the literary, liturgy of, or, or very familiar prayer, Suffer me not to be separated, and let my cry come unto to thee. It's not always an easy poem, that Ash Wednesday, but it is, uh, it is a, very, a very wonderful uh, one. And then, finally, uh, of the poems, there is Marina, published uh, in 1930. It is, I have to admit, a poem that had rather passed me by until Rowan Williams and I shared a day speaking on Eliot not long ago, and he remarked that it so moved him he was not able to read it aloud in public. So it made me think, what on earth have I been missing all these years? And it's also noteworthy, and I found this in this correspondence, that Eliot said it was his favourite poem. The dominant image is based on the recognition of Shakespeare's Pericles of his supposedly lost daughter, Marina. But there is an implied contrast with Seneca's Hercules Furians, in which Hercules comes to and finds he's killed his children, for it is addressed, O oh, my daughter, the boat on which the poet sets sail is an old one, much repaired, and the poem is full of the imagery of Maine, which meant so much to Eliot, and which comes to full flower later in the dry salvages in the four quartets. But here the imagery is not for the coast itself, but for a reconnection with something in himself, set off by Emily Hale, already mentioned in my discussion of Ash Wednesday. Emily Hale his Beatrice, not only channeled his love towards God, but acted as a muse in releasing his poetry. Hers is a face through which grace comes, and that grace, that face, it dissolves in place. And that place is the coastlands and the seas of Maine, which he loved so much as a boy. And on this voyage, he made this unknowing, half-consciously unknown, my own, living in time, beyond time, with the awakened lips parted, the hope, the new ships. So let's just have a brief look at, at Marina. Begins, again, it's not together an easy song, but in the background, you have to, part of the remember this is that, that Elliot as a boy loved sailing and was a very good sailor and used to sail quite a way out on the main coast, uh, off, the main co 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 off the main coast. What seas, what shores, what grey rocks, and what islands, what water lapping the bow, 
and scent of pine and the wood rust singing through the fog, what images return, O oh my daughter? Then it goes on towards the end. I made this, I have forgotten and remember, the week, rigging week and the canvas rotten between one June and another September, made this unknowing, half-conscious, unknown, my own. The garboard straight leaks, the seams need corking. This form, this face, this life, living to live in a world of time beyond me. Let me resign my life for this life, my speech for that unspoken, the awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. What seas, what shores, what granite islands toward my timbers, and wood rush calling through the fog, my daughter. It's interesting that Ellie admitted that his desire for progeny had once been very acute. So like Pericles, Shakespeare's play, which Eliot much admired, the poem is about recognition. Eliot recognized that his pent-up desire to love could be channeled towards God by his newly awakened feeling for Emily as symbolized in his childhood memories of the Maine coast. As I mentioned, Maine was the scene of Eliot's most ambitious sailing ventures. As Lyndall Gordon, who I think is still the best biographer Eliot, puts it, it is there in imagination that his voyager is awakened as the long for call comes through the fog and suppressed emotion for the long lost yet familiar woman breaks out in a cry of recognition. This was the intense new life that Le Le Eliot lived behind the carapace of successful publisher, man of letters and austere celibate Christian. It was a life out of hell into the peace of his will. I think we're coming towards the end, aren't we, Valerie? Which, shall I, would you like me just to read the last... I ha deliberately haven't dealt with four quartets because that's a whole new... Uh, you need a whole lecture to deal with the four quartets. And I was just dealing really with, with a turning point in his life long before he wrote the four quartets. But would you like me just to end with the last few lines of the four quartets because they are... They are wonderful. They bring together his great love and influence of Dante and the images from, from uh, uh, Dante. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves in the sea. Quick, now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crown knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. That last line brings together imagery which runs through the four quartets. The fire, which is the fire of the Holy Spirit, which purges us and brings self-knowledge, and the rose, which comes from Dante, which is the communion of saints. So in that final image, the fire of God's love uh, and the rose, which is the communion of saints, are welded together. The crown fire, fire and the fire and the rose are, are one. But you'll recognize, some of you will recognize those very famous words from the 14th century Jul mystic Julian of, of Norwich, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Wonderful, wonderful words. Gives one hope in the darkest situations. Thank you, Bob.